Hello, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining this talk. Um, the title of the talk is The Structure and Interpretation of Stream Processing. So as you know that it has become a de facto standard in dealing with large scale um, data, large scale and growing data. The stream processing, um, th this mic is working, right? Okay, th thank you. So as I, as I was just saying that stream processing has become a de facto standard in uh, handling large volume and growing volume of data. In a recent year, it has also gained a significant interest from the research community uh, because it poses several challenges such as uh, programming abstraction, um, resiliency, fault tolerance, and so on. So in this talk, what we're planning on doing, we're going to look into the fundamental of stream processing and we are going to analyze the state-of-art stream processing uh, systems from two distinct perspectives. Uh, the first one is the structure. So what are the programming models uh, offered by different stream processing systems? And uh, how they can allow us to write reliable stream processing uh, programs? And then we'll see that how those programs can be executed or evaluated by the stream processors. And also, we're going to take a look at the architectural uh, uh, consideration and semantics of stream processing while discussing about uh, these execution models. And last but not the least, we're going to take a look at the recent trends in the stream processing landscape and also look into the research direction that why we're heading at in this domain. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, a bit about me, my name is Adil and I'm coming from Amsterdam. Uh, this is the second time I'm here in Scala by the Bay. Uh, it's a great conference and it's the second time I've been speaking uh, with, the, with, with, with the jet lag. <laughs> so please bear with me uh, for the rest of the presentation. So I work uh, in a global organization called ING. It's a financial uh, organization uh, based in Amsterdam. And uh, we are operating in 40 different countries, serving around 36 million customers over the world. And we are collecting huge amount of data from different data sources and analyzing it to uh, detect uh, some actionable insight for our customers, uh, mitigate security risks, and also looking into fraudulent transactions and detect that one. So if you take a look at it, uh, we, we have uh, growing a large volume of data from different data sources. Uh, one such data source is real-time transaction uh, stream. So that brings us to the definition of what is a stream. A stream is unbounded sequence of events which has several attributes. For instance, in this case, uh, we're referring to transactions. So it has transaction ID, customer ID, transaction type, and so on. Also, it has some meta information such as uh, timestamp, um, which refers to the time when that event actually happening. So if you take a look at the use cases of stream processing uh, uh, frameworks, there are certain common part there, but uh, there are diverse data sources that we're reading from, and also there are different communication uh, uh, channels out there. But one common part is the pattern and prediction part, that we are reading large volume of data uh, and try to try to detect some kind of pattern, and then try to determine uh, the relevancy of those uh, data. So we are reading huge amount of raw data from different data sources. Um, trying to uh, filter those data, try to detect some pattern in it, and then determine the relevancy. And sending notification to the, to the end users. So if we think about this kind of architecture, uh, it poses several requirements. Uh, one such requirement that the system has to be uh, performed in a low latency and high throughput. It must support fault tolerance and a high availability. And also, it, sub it should support reliable uh, processing. And uh, that's why the stream processing landscape has been evolved from a single node processor to multi-node distributed stream processing systems in the last 10 years. So in the next section, we're going to take a look at how the stream processing system has been evolved in the last 10 years. Um, it has a significant interest from the research community. So the, the initial project were basically the research prototypes, which basically then uh, uh, be become an industry scale uh, project as well. So if we uh, have a close look of how the, this has been evolved, the first generation stream processor were basically an extension on top of database engine. And second generation stream processor where uh, they provided a bit of advanced uh, 
capabilities such as operator expressiveness and advanced query processing. But important to note here is that the first generation stream processor were quite domain specific because they were serving only uh, certain purposes. But as we are going towards the second generation and third generation, it becomes general purpose stream processing frameworks. In the third generation, uh, it focused on, uh, focus on scalable and highly performant, robust towards fault. One most popular stream processing framework, for instance, Storm, is from that generation. And in the fourth generation, uh, the focus was towards uh, deriving the exact results. And also, the fourth generation stream processor provides expressive uh, abstractions, richer window specification, and it supports uh, operation uh, in a highly available way. More, moreover, in the fourth generation stream processor, they also introduce some additional features like transactional processing. Um, and in a real-time situation, it wants to support some asset transaction. For instance, Flink uh, in the recent year uh, provided this streaming ledger support, which basically provides transactionality on top of a stream processor. So let's take a look at uh, the most state-of-art uh, stream processing system out there. The Storm, that was init initially the first popular stream processing platform that made stream processing uh, uh, mainstream. Although it has several limitations, uh, these limitations were enriched by extensions such as Trident. Then one improvement on top of Storm was uh, Heron that was built by Twitter. Spark streaming originated from a research project at Berkeley and then it has become a mainstream stream processing framework. It is built on top of Spark uh, as its core. Then uh, there, there is other open source framework like Samza, for instance, was built by LinkedIn that uses Kafka as its streaming layer and uh, in order to support fault tolerance and uh, yeah, uh, sn snapshot, it used Kafka uh, log. Then uh, we have another research prototype like Flink that was initially built as, as a research project from TU Berlin. Now it's supporting both uh, streaming and batch processing. Then we do have Cloud Dataflow that assimilated several other stream processing framework from Google like uh, Millwell and uh, Flume Java. Uh, but this is a proprietary stream processing framework from uh, Google, so we're not going to focus on that one. We'll be focusing on the open source stream processing framework for the rest of the presentation. So in this section, we're going to take a look at how the programming abstraction has evolved. Uh, this stream processing framework, they provide different uh, level of abstractions, but there are some fundamental commonalities among them. So we're going to highlight them and try to distinguish different kind of stream processing programming abstraction that's out there. So in this section, we're going to take a look at programming abstraction and the primitive that they offer. Then we briefly look into the notion of time and then uh, discuss about the streaming window a programming abstraction that we can find in most stream processing API, regardless of how declarative they are. So the programming abstraction, uh, there are different levels in the, there, uh, like the low level programming abstraction is basically data flow graph. And then on top of it, we provide some functional API. And then on top of it, there is this declarative languages like SQL, Flink SQL, and Spark SQL. So we'll, f we'll first discuss about the low level data flow programming. The modern stream processors such as Strom and Samja, they provide this level of programming where the stream processor, uh, uh, the, the streaming program is encoded as a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, and where each node represents a computation or uh, some kind of operator that's uh, working on uh, streaming input. And uh, user actually in, uh, extends some kind of interface to build those operators. <laughs> and they are interconnected by channels. Uh, thus, those operators can contain some arbitrary complex business logic as well. So just to give you an example, this is a directed acyclic graph where each nodes are uh, uh, computation, and then uh, they are connected with the stream as a, as a channel. To give you an example, uh, let's take a look at the word count, uh, which is basically uh, the popularized, by, popularized by the paper uh, map reduce. Uh, we are reading a set of uh, sentences, a uh, stream of sentences as input, and then there are two operators, like split and count. The split operator is splitting the input as, as a word, and then counting the occurrence of, of word and outputting it in the output channel. 
So if we take a look at the split operator, uh, the pseudocode, how, how we can implement it is like, okay, we have a channel. This channel is basically uh, the output channel. So we are receiving input as uh, sentences and we are splitting those sentences to word and emitting those word in the output channel. On the other hand, if we take a look at the word count uh, operator, it has to maintain some kind of state. For instance, we are reading, uh, we are receiving particular word and we are keeping the count that how many times we have received those words. And we are emitting the word and updated count in the output channel. So important to note here is the managed state, uh, the map state there. This is managed by the stream processor, which has several advantage, like uh, the, the memory management part is handled by the stream processor, so it can be checkpointed or set pointed. Uh, so it, just in case this operator die, then it can restore that operator from its previous state. That's why uh, the modern stream processors as a fleeing, they provide this explicit state management uh, construct. But let's take a look at uh, how this logical data flow graph uh, that we defined earlier, uh, it, it, it gets executed. So this data flow gra graph, when it's, uh, the stream processor schedule this data flow graph, it actually creates multiple instances of those operator. So this data flow graph is sent to multiple machines, so there are multiple instance instances of this DAG getting executed. And the stream processor maintains uh, a couple of things. It maintains the network communication between them. It partitions the data so that different source can receive uh, the partition data. And then it also handles the program recovery in case there is any failure. And execution of uh, stream processor is modeled as a tag of tasks interconnected by stream. In this situation, we can see that the stream actually connects two different kind of operator like split operator and the count operator. So this is an example with, with Strong. And in Strong, the topology is represented by two different kind of operator. One operator is Sprout, that, is, that are the source, and the second kind of operator are Bolt. Uh, those are basically doing transformation on stream. So how can we implement the bowl operator? It's pretty simple. It's like the pseudocode that we have shown earlier. In the, in the, in the word count bowl, it's actually receiving some tuple, and then it's computing the count from it. And you can see two things from here is that uh, it's not using any managed state. It's using some JVM map there, meaning that uh, the failure recovery is the responsibility of this, this bolt. So it's not ma managed by the stream processor uh, inherently. And the second thing that, okay, this execute method is like a Java method that can contain any arbitrary uh, piece of code there. So as, a, as an end user, it's your responsibility what will be encoded in, in your bolt. But it has several disadvantages. For instance, this, uh, State management now becomes responsibility of the end user. So you need to write your own code to, to, to maintain the state reliability. And also, the, in case of out of uh, memory exception, you need to handle that kind of uh, situation as well. So explicit mutable state is, is a requirement for modern stream processing systems. And using the state abstraction of API, uh, this kind of uh, stage managed state is provided by modern stream processors such as Flink uh, and uh, Google Cloud Dataflow and so on. So just to summarize, there are a couple of pros and cons of low-level data flow programming. Uh, the one uh, important aspect there that okay you can write any kind of uh, custom code there so you could write some optimization on data flow execution you can free you can have the freedom to implement your own business logic but the cons is that okay it warrants a good knowledge of execution internal and the abstraction is kind of leaky the internal of uh, the streaming system is exposed via those abstraction and it lacks uh, expressive and rich support of operation. So next level in the abstraction is uh, functional API. The functional API give you more declarative uh, abstraction where you deal with stream as a, as a first class citizen. Uh, it offers higher order function as EDF so you can define uh, with respect to map, flat map, and, uh, and uh, filter that kind of combinators. 
And these are quite known due to the popularity of functional programming. And users only need to deal with the how, what part. The how part is handled by the stream processors. So a typical example of stateless operator like map, filter, flat map, um, split, merge, or union. And there it can also support uh, stateful operators such as join and uh, window operator. We're going to take a look at the window and, uh, in, the rest of the, in, in the later in this presentation. So getting back to the previous word count example, it can be easily written as uh, uh, with few lines where it's getting some input from data source and then doing a flat map on it that's splitting the word into multiple, uh, uh, splitting a sentence into multiple words and it's counting it. And uh, one important aspect there is the key aggregation. So the state management is handled by the uh, abstraction itself. Uh, just to get a bit into detail, like we, we did some partitioning there as well with key by. So it has two oper operators, like split and count. And you can see that after the split operator, the, the word is getting into particular count operator, which is basically due to the fact that we key by uh, the first fill, which is uh, the word in this context. So it allow a particular operator to receive certain keys, uh, and, but we need to be careful about this kind of partitioning because it might end up with a, with a data skew. So next level of abstraction is basically high level uh, declarative languages, uh, such, such as SQL, uh, uh, Fling SQL, Spark SQL, these are the SQL abstraction on top of uh, the functional API. Um, but uh, till now it has been basically re some research prototype that, that was providing it. If you take a look at the Fling SQL documentation, it says that it's not ready yet for uh, the production use cases. So we are not going to uh, dive into this part that uh, much for this presentation. The next thing that I would like to discuss before I, I uh, explain the sliding windows uh, is the notion of time. Uh, in, in the stream processor, there is two kind of events. Uh, the, Sorry, there are two kind of time. One is the event time, another is the processing time. And event time refers to the fact that when the event is actually happening, whereas the processing time refers to the local clock on the machine when the operator is being executed. One of the popular example uh, that distinguish between these two kind of uh, timing, uh, two, two kind of time, uh, is the, the Star Wars uh, analogy, where the, the, the Phantom Menace was uh, the first uh, on, the, on the series, but it was delivered in 1999, whereas the New Hope was the fourth in the series, but it was delivered or processed in 1977. So that means that the streaming system, you, you need to deal with this out of orderness uh, to some extent. But this notion of time is used uh, in in defining the stream windows. And the stream window collect messages based on, based on finite size of time frame, emit new messages based on a specified trigger, and after that it turns the given competition on the collected messages. So just to give you an example, here we have a, a set of, uh, we have a stream of <laughs> integers. And uh, this batch window is running on a certain interval and computing the average. It's taking like two elements every time and computing the average on it. So this kind of window is also called tumbling window. Uh, this window do not overlap in time, thus a message is processed in exactly one time window. Then the second kind of window is sliding window, whereas where it actually slides and overlaps within time. And this message is collected, uh, several messages collected But it's a 40 minute talk. <laughs> so I see that there was some confusion about the time, uh, but yeah, I, I have some time left to discuss the rest of the presentation, I guess. So, okay, so I was, I was discussing about the sliding window. In a sliding window, the, a message can be, uh, and the, the window can contain the same messages, uh, uh, like, like it slides over time. So a sliding window can overlap in time, thus a message can be collected in multiple windows. There, there are third kind of windows like session window. 
In session window, uh, it groups the element based on uh, the activity, so it has this notion of gap inactivity. Whenever some gap happens, it starts a new window there. Um, so it's basically a bit of uh, undeterministic to some extent, but it, it groups element by the session activity. And this is one kind of window that's uh, provided by Fling at this point. So just to recap, uh, Spark Streaming and Fling, they both support sliding and time windows, also support batch windows there. But Samza uh, or other, other framework like Storm doesn't even support any kind of windowing mechanism by, uh, by default. So you need to write your own windowing mechanism there. Uh, some, in case of Samza, it only supports the time windows. So let, let's take a look at some more code. In this situation, we are connected with a Twitter uh, source. We are going to extract the hashtag from it and then count the topic and emit the most trending topic for certain uh, time frame or certain windows. So again, due to the declarativeness of uh, the Fling API, you can write this code in just few lines of code. In the first part, we are reading something from the, the data source and then um, then what we're doing, we are collecting all the hashtags and then we defining a sliding window which basically uh, describes as follows that every 10 seconds most trending tweet of last 60 seconds will be emitted. So this, that's the sliding window specification. And then we are looking into the Twitter hashtag feed. We are partitioning it based on the tags and counting those tags and apply this window on it. So at the end, it's just emitting the top two, um, uh, top two tweets from, uh, from last uh, 60 seconds. So if we take a look at the top case, basically a very naive implementation of, uh, the, of this thing, uh, algorithm, but it, based, on the, based on the window, it gets a collection of elements uh, as its input. And then you can, you can sort that input and, and find out the top key, top key elements from it. So the sliding window or the windowing mechanism gives you this ability to, to discretize your stream into a certain chunk and then apply some transformation on that chunk and emit the output from it. But if you have to implement the same thing with uh, Storm, uh, yeah, it gets really big because it doesn't natively support you um, that kind of operators. So you need to write everything by your own hand and then you need to maintain that and provide resilience and fault tolerance as well. So uh, there's a lot of boilerplates that you need to handle if you apply the low-level data flow programming, but as you move uh, a bit upward uh, and start using the declarative APIs, then it becomes much easier. It handles all kind of concern for you. So, but it, one drawback is that it has less control. The programmer uh, that used to write the low-level code now writing in an abstract way which has a benefit of automatic optimization. So it allow, although it allow inexperienced users to dive into stream processing, uh, it takes some kind of freedom from them, but which has definitely some positive side effects like automatic optimization and so on. So in this section, we look into different programming abstractions, uh, like the low-level programming abstraction, functional API, and declarative language. And you also looked into like how you can encode a program uh, as such that it can be used, uh, it, can be, it can be applied in, in different contexts. So there are three different abstraction levels we discussed, and there are three different, uh, in three different abstractions, you saw how the operator expressiveness and state management can help us in dealing with uh, different concerns of stream processing system. In the next part of this presentation, we're take, going to take a look into the runtime uh, of, of this, uh, this abstraction. So we define a programming uh, streaming program with some kind of abstractions, but then we need to be executed some in, in a runtime. So in this section, we're going to take a look at the execution model and some interesting property of those execution model in detail. So there are several papers on this topic uh, that, that outline the requirement of distributed stream processor and its execution model. But in this talk, we're going to focus on the certain aspects of it. For instance, the processing guarantees, fault tolerance, flow control, and so on. So if we take a look at the execution model, that is basically the core of a stream processing system. It encapsulates the coordination of any streaming competition 
In fact, different stream processors exhibit alternative design consideration. But if we categorize it into two distinctive categories, there are two main uh, uh, thoughts there. One is the stream data flow, and second one is the micro batching. So I'm going to start with the streaming data flow. The streaming data flow uh, operates on uh, every event of a stream. So as the event comes in, it, it, it executes some code. Uh, one of the benefit of it is that it is it, 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 its syntax or its primitives are quite uh, it's it's basically close to the streaming architecture or streaming semantics. It's provided direct mapping of streaming semantics and execution entities. So the even level granularity has some plus point as well. Like uh, you, uh, it, it provides us the low latency. But one of the problem of this streaming uh, data flow approach is that um, the fault tolerance and the control flow become much more complicated. The second kind of uh, approach is a micro batch approach, which basically uh, discretize the stream into multiple batches and then that will get executed in a, in, in, on top of a batch execution engine. For instance, Spark uh, streaming uh, follow this approach. Uh, one of the problem with this uh, kind of execution model is the semantics. It's no longer a streaming semantics. Basically, you start writing code on uh, a set of events, or set of batch. But one of the, pr one of the Positive side of this kind of abstraction is that the fault tolerance. You get this fault tolerance by default from uh, uh, from a batch-oriented system, uh, like uh, Hadoop or Spark has a native support of fault tolerance and control flow. In this kind of model, you get that from, uh, automatically, and also it enables high throughput. There is an additional benefit that it actually combines both streaming and uh, the batch processing together. So you could use some intermediate result from the batch processing uh, while executing the stream, streaming part. But one of the drawbacks is that it introduced the discretization latency. So each time there are some event coming, you need to wait till the micro batch is complete. So therefore, it's, it's provide, uh, it, provide, it doesn't provide low latency in this context. So we do have these two different approaches and there are different uh, streaming systems that actually use these two different uh, approaches. Fling, Storm, Heron, Samza, they follow the stream data flow approach, whereas Spark streaming and Storm Trident extension offer micro-batching. One of the benefits of micro-batching that we have seen in the recent years is that they uh, offer better processing guarantees. For instance, if Spark streaming has been supporting exactly once for a long time. On the other hand, uh, due to the recent advancement in the stream processing, Flinks uh, now also support ex exactly one semantics. So next, we're going to take a look at the processing guarantees. Um, so what does that mean? A processing guarantee refers to the state of the application upon failure. The execution in stream processor is modeled as a DAG of task where those tasks are interconnected by stream. Uh, system deals with task failure to satisfy one of the following from its processing guarantees. That is, at most once, at least once, exactly once. I'm going to define what does that even mean in this in next slide. So if we take a look at the task from a data flow, a task, what does it do? It basically processes some input, it updates the state, and emits some output. So we can derive two, in, two properties from it. One is the guaranteed processing, uh, meaning that uh, all input in the task input dependency will be delivered to the task and fully processed at least once. And then uh, the second property is the consistent update. Each input record should lead to exactly one uh, update in the state. So if we have these two property defined, then we can actually, based on that, we can define all kinds of processing guarantees. For instance, in at most one situation, neither property one or property two satisfied. In case of at least once, the only property one is guaranteed, meaning that, okay, it might result in the replaying of some events, uh, but uh, the system has to deal with it via idempotence, uh, idempotency. In case of exactly once, both property one and property two must be, uh, must be guaranteed. So based on this processing guarantee, uh, the stream processing execution engine support fault tolerance and uh, all other kind of uh, interesting property to enable reliable stream processing. In the next section, uh, we're going to take a look at how different stream processing systems offer these kind of guarantees. 
for instance, Spax, uh, for instance, Tom offer only uh, at least once, uh, but with Trident it can offer exactly one semantics. Spark, on the other hand, um, it, it supports exactly one semantics. Flink support also supports exactly one semantics, and recently it supports uh, additional support for the transaction via streaming ledger. Samja, on the other hand, has a FIFO channel and it supports exactly, uh, uh, sorry, at least one semantics. So next we'll look into the fault tolerance part, that uh, how the system handles fault tolerance and ensure this kind of processing warranties. The fault in a distributed system may appear in several different places, but we generally classify two different kinds of faults. Uh, for instance, consider this data flow graph, there, are, there could be two kinds of fault. One that, okay, a message uh, is failed to get delivered, and the second one is like, okay, a node can be uh, inactive or it can, it can uh, die. So in these two situations can be handled by two fundamental approaches like uh, event tracking and state management. So what is event tracking? An event tracking situation uh, deals with the uh, fact that this is a message might not be delivered. Um, there are two approaches for event tracking. One is the repeatable stream logs, and the second one is record acknowledgement. And in the repeatable stream log, uh, logs, it persists the stream into uh, a log. Uh, for instance, it uses Kafka to persist the log. Some they use this approach. So one of the benefits of this approach is that you can replay those events and, and, and uh, ensure the guaranteed processing part of the property one that we discussed earlier. In, this, in the second kind of situation, it's record acknowledgement, meaning that, okay, you send an event in the downstream operator, you wait for the acknowledgement from this down, downstream operator. If you do not get any acknowledgement, then you send that event again. For instance, Storm use this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, mechanism uh, to ensure some kind of some form of uh, fault tolerance it uses this notion of hackers which actually uh, keeps a tree of uh, event that's happening in your system so at any point in time if it detects that one of the one of the event is not being delivered then it replay that event and that's how it ensures some some, some notion of uh, at least one steady very one thing so other systems like Flink, some job that has this checkpointing capability, so this event tracking is quite uh, related to that one as well. Like, okay, you restore a checkpoint, then you start replaying some events from it in order to get to the state where it was before the failure. The second kind of uh, mechanism uh, that is used for the fault tolerance is state management. In the state management situation, uh, deals with the fact that a task can die. And in that situation, it wants to rebuild the state where it was uh, before the task uh, yeah, was done. So two approaches uh, for it. One is active replication, meaning that, okay, there are multiple redundant operator processing at the same time. Uh, in this situation, if one node die, immediately the other node can start processing the events. One of the problem with this kind of approach is the computational capability it requires. It has to deal with uh, replicating the messages to all operators and then deal with it. So there are a lot of redundancy in this situation, but one of the plus side is that uh, the fault tolerance become much easier. The state management is easy in this situation. And recovery is also trivial. You just need to swap from one failed node to another node. In the passive backup situation, uh, there, uh, there is basically one node that, uh, that is uh, keeping the state and, uh, and updating the checkpoints. Uh, but uh, as, uh, as a node die, then uh, the other node can restore the checkpoint from the, from the uh, store. So there is some persistent store in this situation. Different uh, System like Storm that doesn't provide any kind of uh, any kind of reliable storage, uh, so it uses Trident for this state management, but it provides an API that you need to build uh, everything by yourself. On in case of Storm, uh, sorry, in case of Spark Streaming, you use RDD to 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 do this kind of checkpointing, and RDD state are periodically checkpointed to limit the number of operations required for restoring the state. As some I use Kafka, uh, as simple as that. It's just write everything to Kafka. It uses the log compaction of Kafka, so it's heavily using Kafka for uh, state management. Flink, on the other hand, uh, similar to Kafka, use periodic checkpoints. 
and support persistence backend such as RocksDB, and uh, it, it 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 improved upon the how the checkpointing is done. It uses some kind of asynchronous and lightweight uh, snapshotting to keep the stuff in a, to, to to keep the stuff in a reliable way. So there are some additional uh, notes, like for instance. Uh, Millwell and Google Cloud Dataflow that use the external data sources for this persistence, so the consistency has to be guaranteed by this remote storage. Flink and Spark streaming use the partition local storage. Storm, Heron, they do not use any kind of reliable storage, so you need to deal with, they need to deal with the yourself. The user needs to deal with the reliability part. Then there is a, another important aspect of a, uh, con of a, of a system, is, that is the flow control mechanism. And the flow control mechanism deals with the fact that, let's say that you have an upstream node and a downstream node, and the downstream node is uh, having some performance problem, so the upstream node should not send all the messages to the downstream. In that case, it might result in the drop of pack packets, or uh, the upstream, upstream node could be, could be storing that in its own storage and exhaust the memory. So that's why the flow control mechanism is very important, and there are two distinctive ways the, this, this works. One is the source back pressure. In this situation, the overload operator sends overload signal to the source uh, at the back pressure signal. Uh, a spark streaming here on Storm that use this kind of uh, back pressure. In case of spark streaming, it actually, since it's using the micro batching, it can find out the ingestion rate, and then from that, it can derive that how how much micro, how much how much batch it needs to send to the downstream node. In case of Heron, it used the sprout back pressure output, so there is any kind of uh, uh, problem with the underlying node, then it sends initiate back pressure signal to the top, and then um, it just work from there. And it also broadcasts that uh, initial back pressure to the other nodes so that other sprout can uh, slow down. When the situation is over, it can send all clear signal to the, to the downstream nodes. Strom uses the same approach that Heron used. But one problem is the rate imbalance that one operator can receive a lot of input, uh, receive input and create a lot of output from it in case of join operation. And in this situation, if you send a back pressure signal to the source, it doesn't make much sense because yeah, it doesn't solve the actual problem and it might result in a resource exhaustion. The second kind of approach is the edge by edge uh, back pressure is similar to TCP flow. So a overflow operator send uh, signals to its uh, upstream node, which in turn sends signal to its uh, other upstream node. It has this notion of uh, Credit based uh, buffer where you can, you can, every operator has a limited number of credit to send information to the downstream node. So if it exhausts that credit, then it can't really send any more information. Uh, Flink, for instance, employ uh, this kind of uh, back pressure. One of the problems with this kind of uh, back pressure, with, this, with the edge by edge back pressure, uh, that the liveliness is not guaranteed in cyclic topologies. So if you have a problem in a node, then you send a back pressure signal all the way to your upstream node, which might end up in a back pressure signal coming into your, in the, the, exactly the same node, result in a deadlock situation. So there has been a lot of research done, is going on in this, in this area, how to handle this kind of cyclic topology and back pressure at this point. So just to recap, the flow control strategy, Storm doesn't use any kind of, uh, it's used a similar flow control strategy from Heron. Samza is the interesting one that does not have its own flow control strategy. It uses Kafka for its uh, flow control mechanism. So it's right, every, everything it gets, it writes into Kafka immediately, so it doesn't need any flow control by itself. It relies on uh, Kafka uh, for that. So we looked into uh, different properties of a data flow system, but if I take a look at, if we closely take a look at the trend, we see that there has been a unification between the batch and streaming model. While initial stream processors were domain specific, the new one are very general in purpose. There is a stronger guarantee that we uh, get from a stream processing system like the async transaction capabilities. And uh, the operators are get, getting more expressive. We have the higher order functions and uh, uh, we, can apply richer window specification. So the primitives are getting more expressive. The research direction, there are a uh, couple of interesting things that's happening. One is a decentralized deployment in case of IoT applications. 
cost efficiency. So we want to run this streaming system on cloud. So we want to minimize uh, our cost. And uh, therefore, there has been a lot of research. Instead of using uh, the simple load balancing, uh, we could use SLF-based load balancing to mitigate that kind of uh, issue. Then we need to integrate different kind of engines. So there has been active research going on. So given your use case, uh, different stream processor can be selected to do part of it. Uh, then there has been a lot of research going on with respect to, for instance, uh, unified uh, abstraction such as uh, uh, Beam offers. So you can specify in one programming model, and then it can be transport. It, it can be run in different kind of uh, runner, like Flink Beam Runner or Spark Streaming Beam Runner, as long as they support all the semantics that Beam requires. And infrastructure awareness is another research directions. Uh, like okay, you. You just don't uh, deploy the stuff in, uh, without, without, without taking into consideration the infrastructure, but look into infrastructure as, a, as one of the key components while deploying uh, the topology or DAG into those uh, infrastructure. So the key takeaway from this talk that, okay, we looked into different key uh, programming abstraction and stream execution model and a fundamental attribute of a stream processing system like processing guarantees fault tolerance, state management, and flow control mechanism. And we also discussed the current trend and future uh, directions. So although there are different streaming processing systems, fundamentally they offer similar capabilities uh, with, uh, with some uh, architectural constraint there, like processing guarantees, fault tolerance, and so on. But the programming abstraction, one is a streaming-based abstraction, other is a micro-based abstraction. And based on that, the primitives are a bit different. But fundamentally, they are offering the same thing. So we need to take those into account while selecting a distributed stream processors uh, without considering this kind of property. If we just select one, then it might not be the right one for your situation. So we only scratch the surface of uh, this landscape. Uh, I wish you all the best in your future journey in stream processing. Yep. Yes, if you have any questions. Yeah, you mentioned that one of the research areas is more of a for key spaces in the spirit of I don't think question maybe you can argue them more on that topic. But I think the question is how you know what do you rely on the timing uh in this system? So if you have a event time, uh, you you still rely on the plays um uh, the timing for this is one of the interesting problem in that domain as well. Huh? So in our situation, we have a Kafka, Kafka cluster that's running on a different uh, data centers. And we all often uh, see the pro problem with the granularity of the time. And then the event time, uh, we need to deal with the out of orderness. So there has been active research going on that how to, I mean, how to make it uh, consistent with respect to the event time. So therefore, we, we move from the processing time to event time notion, uh, meaning that, OK, when the event is happening, we, we track that part and we use it inside the stream processing system. But it's not a solved problem yet. We, we still deal with those granularity issues. Yep. OK, thank you so much for joining this talk.